So um, this morning we're continuing on our series on the book of Acts, and um, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 13 through 16 in particular. If you have a Bible, if you want to open up to Acts 13, uh, the title of the message is Three People You Need Most in Your Life. Three people that you need most in your life. So we're going to talk about who those three people are. But before we do that, um, I wanted to kind of follow up with last week's message. So sometimes I'm wondering, like, hey, are you guys really listening? Are you applying? You know, are you guys going home and actually putting feet to, you know, the actions and, you know, doing that? And this past week, I've been really encouraged. There have been several people that have come to me and said, hey, Pastor Brad, you know, listen to last week's message, and I want to tell you about this in my life. And actually, there's three people, Taryn in the back, back here, John, who's listening online, uh, is at home, and then um, actually uh, Herschel and Kim are here this morning, and I see Herschel. Herschel and Kim, is Kim here? Oh, there she is. If you two could come on up. Let's give Herschel and Kim a hand as they come on up. Come on up, guys. Come on up. So, so I could have called on Taryn. I could have called on John at home, but in particular, I was hanging out with Herschel and Kim on Thursday night. Uh, on Thursday evenings, we do a class here, a group here. It's a life group, it's a class group. It's all those things combined. It's called Alpha. And we've been doing it for the last five weeks or so. And Alpha is for people um, who are either new Christians or they are people who are not Christians and have lots of questions or they're for people who've been a Christian for a long time but have never really been in a small group environment where they could ask questions and, you know, grow in their faith in that kind of a way. And um, so there's anywhere from, I don't know, four of us to nine of us that will come and hang out on a Thursday night. And so this past Thursday night, um, I was hanging out with Herschel and with Kim, and we we're just talking about church and life. And Herschel's like, hey, Pastor Rad, I want to tell you something. And I'm like, okay, Herschel, what do you have to tell me? And um, so He's, he's like, tell me about his work situation. Because this is, this is kind of a follow-up. Remember last week, who was the primary character, the person in the Bible that we talked about? Anybody remember his name last week? Who? Philip. Who said that? Thanks, Joy. Yes, Philip. Right. Thank you, Joy. One person was listening. First service, everybody knew, just so you guys know. <laughs> Only Joy knew second service. So we were talking about a guy named Philip last week. Acts chapter 8. And Philip was, he was known as the, the what? He was in evangelist. Like, remember, we talked about last week how he went to a place called Samaria and he shared his faith up in this area called Samaria. Lots of crowds and people came to know Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit told him, hey, we want you to go down this desert road. And there's a guy that's going to be, actually the Holy Spirit didn't tell him, said, the Holy Spirit said, just go on this desert road. And he goes down and there's this guy from Ethiopia and from Africa and he shares his faith, right? Remember, and the guy gets baptized. Y'all remembering that now? Okay, right? So, you know, we were talking about that, about God putting people in our lives that we can share our faith with. And I told you guys that, I've shared this multiple times, one of my spiritual goals this year is to share my faith with five people outside of the walls of North Point. And it hasn't happened yet, like nobody. Well, all of a sudden, Herschel waltzes in last week and on Thursday night, and he's like, hey, i got to tell you something. And so what happened, Herschel? Well, um, I work in a warehouse where everybody talks, and you get to know everybody there. And... Um inspired by his service, and God gave me the courage to talk to the most atheist person I know that works there about Jesus. Wow. So, so okay, so right. So last week, Herschel's at work, and he's known this guy for a couple years. When you say he's the most atheistic guy you know, like he doesn't believe in Jesus. Not at all. No. Like he doesn't even believe Jesus is a real person, apparently. He didn't apparently. believe he was a real person that right. ever existed. So, so Herschel goes in, feels inspired by the Holy Spirit, and speaks to him, and you know, Herschel goes in, and what happens? What do you say to the dude? Well, I had to convince, him that, he, <laughs> I had to convince him that he was a real person. I gave him some sources, um, some philosophers outside of Christianity that could, you know, that talk about him. And I, um, something I learned in Alpha was uh, he um, told me that Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord. Right, right. And I explained that to him, and he listened. Wow, wow, incredible. So this guy, his name is Nick, right? So, Herschel, now, have you ever done this before? No. Did you ever see yourself doing this? No. Did you? <laughs> so, you felt like, oh, you know, you felt like God's kind of speaking to you and I'm giving you the, the boldness to go up to this guy and to share about Jesus Christ with this guy. Yes, sir. That is incredible. That is incredible. And uh, did, you, did you go to seminary, Herschel? No. 
Okay. <laughs> Didn't go to Bible college? No, not like no. that. No. So, so you're just kind of an ordinary guy, right? Mm-hmm. Just an ordinary guy that was used by God to talk to Nick last week, right? <laughs> Guys, that's pretty inspiring. It really is. It's pretty inspiring. So Herschel and I are talking about this, right? We can pass the phone to Mike, to phone to Kim. So Herschel and I are talking about this. And all of a sudden, Kim is standing there. She's kind of, you know, eavesdropping apparently or something. I don't know. <laughs> and she decides to start talking to us. And she apparently was, well, you tell them what happened. Um, so I've just known Herschel for a couple weeks. I, I mean, I guess last week is probably the most I'd ever even talked to him. But um, last week during um, worship, I was standing right behind him and his wife. And the Lord just placed this desire on my heart to pray for him. Um, and so I did. And I just kind of prayed for, um, since he was with his wife, I just prayed for them and their relationship. And um, just that uh, Herschel would just be able to surrender his life. And just that he'd be so full of God that there'd be, like, none of him left. Um, and he would just, God's desires would be his desires. And, um, and just for boldness and courage. And God um, blessed him with that. Amen. So listen to that, folks. So, yes. So... Kim, who doesn't even know Herschel from Adam, she is standing behind him, and she prays for his family, prays for his marriage, and then she prays that Herschel would have boldness. And what does Herschel go do? He shares his faith with somebody last week. That, you guys, is incredible. Let's give these guys a hand this morning. Thanks, Kim. (laughs) Guys, hopefully that should inspire you. I mean, like, again, like... You know, it's really happening. It's going on, and people are listening, and people are responding. And, and so I just want to encourage you. It encouraged me so much. Listen to these guys talk. You know, like, wow, God, you orchestrated all these things. And so to me, that's just really inspiring. And I could, there's other stories. I've had at least two other people last week talk to me about sharing their faith with people. And so I hope as you listen, like even this morning, you will walk away, and we're going to talk about three people, and you're going to go, oh, yeah. Do I have this person, this person? Do I have these people in my life? And am I that to somebody else? Like, hopefully, Herschel walks away today. He's like, oh, yeah, I need to be this kind of a person. Or am I this to somebody else? So hopefully, Herschel does that. He asks that question. Hopefully, you guys are doing that. Matter of fact, we did this first service. Uh, The guy's name is Nick, correct, Herschel? And so we're going to pause just for a moment um, because we believe that God moves when his people pray. And so let's pray for Nick together as a church, okay? Just join with me. Father, thank you for uh, Herschel and for Kim and for the way that you use the two of them in coordination, Lord, to bring boldness and for Herschel to be able to go and to share his faith in a very simplistic way. Herschel's just an ordinary guy, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment and he was used by you. Thank you for placing that burden upon Kim's heart to pray for him, to have boldness. And wow, he did. He had boldness. And that, what a miracle. And we pray for the seeds that were planted by Herschel in Nick's life. And uh, we thank you for Herschel's relationship with him. And the Lord help Herschel to continue to be a good witness to him. And we pray for Nick that those seeds would bear fruit and that Nick would come to a saving relationship, that he would surrender his life to you. He doesn't even believe in you, Jesus, like even that you're a historical figure. But may there be this moving and stirring in his heart. May he not be able to understand what it is, but may you draw Nick into a relationship with you. And may not only Nick's life be changed, but may future generations of his family be changed also because of those seeds that were planted. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. So uh, this morning, so I want you to kind of think about, you know, what happened just now. And I want you to think about applying the words this morning. So we're going to talk about three people that you need, three most important people in your life. And I'm going to give them to you up front. There will be fill-ins later on. They'll be in red so you guys will know uh, if you're taking notes this morning. Um, but there's three people that you need in your life. Everybody needs a Barnabas. Everybody say Barnabas. Everybody needs a Barnabas. Do you know that outside of like Peter, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, Barnabas is one of the most talked about persons in all the books, a book of Acts. It's a letter 28 chapters long. And many Christians, they have no clue who Barnabas even is. Like, who's Barnabas? I've never even heard of the Joker. Over 24 times, Barnabas' name is mentioned in the book of Acts. The Bible talks about him time and time and time again, all throughout the book of Acts, even beyond the book of Acts. 
his name is referenced and mentioned in Scripture. We all need a Barnabas in our lives. We all need to be a Barnabas to somebody else. Secondly, we all need a Paul in our life. We all need a Paul in our life. Everybody say Paul. Paul. We all need a Paul in our life. Someone that's not necessarily older than us, but someone who is further along in their relationship with Christ than us. We need someone that we can look to, who can speak into our lives. We all need a Paul in our life, and we need to be a Paul to somebody else. The third person is, we all need a Timothy in our life. Everybody say Timothy. Timothy Timothy was a young man, and he was mentored, and he was discipled by the Apostle Paul. And Timothy wasn't Paul's son by birth. Timothy was uh, was a guy, had a mom, had a dad, and, and it wasn't the Apostle Paul. But when you look in Scripture, when you look in the Bible, you see that Paul considered Timothy his spiritual child, someone that he had mentored and that he trained and that he grew up and helped shepherd his relationship with Jesus Christ. And every single one of us, the Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew 28, that we are to go out and make disciples. And when Jesus said that, he's talking to all of us as Christ followers. None of us are excluded. Doesn't, it's not just people like me that need to have a Timothy. It's every single one of us in this room that needs to have a Timothy in our lives. We all need to have a Barnabas. We all need to have the apostle, uh, a Paul. And we all need to have a Timothy in our lives. Now, I want us to start and, and kind of focus on Barnabas a little bit here. And we're going to get to Acts chapter 13. But before we do, we kind of need to paint a picture. You're saying, this guy's mentioned all throughout the book of Acts. Well, Let's, let's look a little bit of the background about, about uh, Barnabas, okay? So Acts chapter 4, verse 32. You guys can follow along with me. It'll be on the screen. But Acts 4, 32 is kind of a famous passage of Scripture. It's painting a picture of what the early church looked like. And most of us are probably aware of this. And there's some really famous verses here. And, you know, we all try to have a church look like this and be like this. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And these believers, this early church, they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything that they had. I mean, that's a great kind of a church to be a part of. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's great blessing was upon them all. Verse 34, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them. And they would bring the money to the apostles to give to those that were in need. And then all of a sudden, Luke, Dr. Luke, who's writing this passage, who's writing this book, he's going to tell us specifically about a couple individuals. Several weeks ago, um, we read about one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, this couple that were married, and they sold land, and they held money back, and they lied to God about it. They lied to the apostles about it, and and they fell over dead. But it also tells us, Luke tells us about another person, Barnabas. It says, for instance, There was Joseph, that was his given name. There was Joseph, his Hebrew name, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. Barnabas means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi. Uh, Typically, if you were from the tribe of Levi, if you lived in Israel, you would go to the temple and you were almost like on staff at the local, at, at the temple, and you would perform priestly duties. Um, but if you, when you weren't doing that, then you were this educated priest and you would teach other people and you would instruct other people. Um, so that's the kind of the background that Barnabas had. It says that he was from the tribe of Levi and he came from the island of Cyprus. Barnabas sold a field that he owned and he brought the money to the apostles. So Barnabas is incredibly generous. The church is just starting. He has land. He takes it. He brings it to the apostles Gives him all this land from this money that he sells. People are like, wow, this is, you know, what a, generous, what a generous guy he is. We learn a little bit more about Barnabas later on in Acts chapter 9. So you guys probably remember the story. The Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of the letters in the New Testament, he comes to know Jesus Christ. He'd been persecuting people. He was um, there at the death of of Stephen, when Stephen was martyred that we read about in Acts chapter 7. He went from city to city. He went up to Damascus, to another city up north, and he dragged people out of, out of their houses, and he, he had them tortured and beaten and beat up because they were followers of Christ. All of a sudden, you know, hopefully you've been reading along, um, Jesus appears to this guy named Saul, and, you know, and Saul, he commits his heart and his life to Jesus Christ, chooses to follow Jesus Christ. 
he goes to Jerusalem, where all the early church is, and it tells us what happens when Saul goes to Jerusalem. It says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. Remember, he had had one guy killed just a couple chapters earlier. You know, and he's pulling people out of their homes. Well, of course the believers were all afraid of him. It says they did not believe he had truly become a believer. They thought it was a ruse, a trick, right? Verse 27 says, but then Barnabas, the guy who sold all of his land, gave the money to the church. Then Barnabas brought him, talking about Paul, to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to this guy, Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Verse 28. So they stayed, so Saul stayed with the apostles and went around, all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Here he is, Saul, the guy who writes most of the New Testament. He commits his life to Jesus. He goes to Jerusalem to see these, the leaders of the early church. And they're like, no, we don't want anything to do with you. We don't, you know, we don't trust you. Why would they? Barnabas is like, no, no, no. I, I, I've seen this. I know about this. I've watched the Apostle Paul. I've, or I've watched this guy named Saul. And he, and he stands in the gap and he speaks on behalf of this guy named Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul. It was Barnabas who did that. Barnabas helps give some credibility to the change that's taking. He came alongside of him. He was kind of like a cheerleader for him. Say, no, no, no. I know this guy. I've seen what God has done in his life. Imagine what would have happened if if Barnabas wasn't there. If he wasn't there to encourage and to come alongside of someone like that. The apostles would have been like, oh, yeah, we don't have anything to do with this guy. Story continues on, and um, we we see in Acts chapter 11 um, that another story about this guy named Barnabas a church up in northern Israel in a place called Antioch. All these people were coming to know Jesus Christ. And it says that in Acts chapter 11, it says, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas, this guy who was an encourager, right? This guy who knew scripture and who had spoken on behalf of the apostle Paul. They sent Barnabas to Antioch, this city. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessings, people coming to Christ, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and he was strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. I would have been like, hey man, this is incredible. God's using me. All these people are coming to know Jesus Christ. You know, everything's great. You know, life is really, really good. This is amazing. But then this verse 25 is really interesting. It says, Barnabas then went to Tarshish, traveled hundreds of miles away to look for Saul. This guy that had come to know Jesus Christ and went down to Jerusalem and, and Barnabas testifies on his behalf. And after that, we, you know, the apostle Paul, his name is Saul at that time, kind of drifts off into several years of not being heard of. Barnabas is like, oh yeah, wait a minute. I remember Saul, this guy, and I know that God wants to use him, and I know that he's really gifted, and God wants to use him to teach other people. So he goes and he looks for him. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, it says. He brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Super interesting. Barnabas, he wasn't concerned about, you know, having all the attention or the limelight on him. He's like, oh yeah, I know this guy. And I know God wants to use him. So he went and he looked for him. He was a cheerleader for him. He was an encourager to him. He brings him to the city and God uses him in a great mighty way. Verse 30 says that that they were entrusted with gifts, Barnabas and Saul. It says that Um, They were entrusted with gifts to Barnabas and Saul, and they took these gifts to the elders at the church in Jerusalem. Um, It's interesting, and when you ever read about Barnabas and Saul early on, it always mentions Barnabas, and then it mentions Saul, or the Apostle Paul. Because Barnabas was the leader of this little group of two people. He was the one that was leading everything. 
We all need a Barnabas in our life. I wrote in your fill-ins there, the kind of the next slide in red, it says we all need a Barnabas. We all need an encouraging person in our life with whom that we share life with who strengthens us along the way. We all need someone who will encourage us, who will challenge us, who will care for us, someone that we can share life together in order to become more like Christ. We all need a Barnabas. You know, I, um, I, I, I was sharing with the first service. I don't know where I read this this week. It's kind of a whatever. But I think it was Mark Twain who said um, something like this. To, to have a good friend, you've got to be a good friend. Some people, they just, they're just like, man, I have no good friends in my life. And sometimes I wonder, well, are you a good friend to other people? Because it's hard to have good friends when you're not a good friend to other people. We all need people in our lives who are going to encourage us. But we also need to be encouraging other people around us. You know, the power of encouragement. When someone cheerleads you and sees the best in you. Like nobody saw the best in this guy named Saul. They saw a persecutor. They saw all these mistakes that he made in his past. I mean, have you ever been there? Been like, oh, I've, you know, how many of us have made huge mistakes in your past? Raise your hands. Yeah, all of you guys who doesn't have their hand raised. Okay, some of you guys will call you out, right? But Barnabas was there. Thank God that Barnabas was there to say, oh no, I know your past, Saul, but I see what God wants to do in your life. We all need someone to encourage us, to cheerlead us. You know, uh, two years ago, I ran the New York City Marathon. And, you know, when you, there's 50,000 people that run the marathon. And when you run the marathon, do you know it's the largest marathon in the world, New York City. And not only that, but over a million people are on the streets watching the marathon. I mean, we're talking, it's, I know, super, super, super deep. You know, rows and rows of people. And you have your name on your, it's called a bib. You have your name on your bib. And so... Obviously, you know, my name's Brad, and, you know, for 26.2 miles, it's like, you know, you're just, you're just suffering. And people are like, come on, Brad, you can do it. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's exhilarating, but it's also super obnoxious at the same time, if you know what I mean. <laughs> sometimes it's like, you shut up, you don't even know me. You get out here and do this. But most of the time, it's really, really encouraging. You're so thankful that people are there to cheerlead you, Chip. You know, call your name. We all need people like that in our life. The next slide says this. Who in your life needs built up? Who can you think of this morning who needs built up? Who can you be a Barnabas to? Who needs strengthened? Who needs encouraged in your life? Who in your life needs someone to see the best in them that nobody else sees? You know, it's interesting in Acts chapter 13, verse 42. You know, from, from the very beginning of Acts, when Paul and Barnabas are mentioned together, it's always Barnabas first and then Paul. But as they continue on in ministry, after Acts chapter 13, verse 42, it's always Paul's name who's mentioned first and then Barnabas. But you know you have a Barnabas in your life when someone wants to cheerlead, encourage you, and spur you on and push you on. And they don't have to have the limelight or the credit for that. That's the kind of person that you need to be to others and that you want to have in your life. A Barnabas. You know, there's one more passage that I want to share with you. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. tells a story. Um, Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. It wasn't just the two of them. They're traveling all around Turkey and Greece and so on and so forth. And people are coming to know Jesus. And they had other traveling companions. And one of their traveling companions was a guy, and his name was John Mark. And we read from Colossians, another book in the Bible, that John Mark was actually a cousin to Barnabas. And this guy named John Mark was traveling with them on their first missionary journey. And it says that as they're traveling, it says that John Mark left Paul and Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem. Now, we don't exactly know why he left. But in the middle of their journey, he bails on Paul. He bails on Barnabas. And he goes home. He's probably a mama's boy, quite honestly. 
His mom's name was Mary, and the apostles in Jerusalem would meet in their home. They would have their prayer meetings, and he saw these things taking place. And he was probably a pretty young guy, and he's with Paul, and Paul's super intense. He's with his cousin Barnabas. Things don't go super well for him, apparently for some reason. And he goes home to his mom, right? And Paul is extremely upset later on. We don't know, they don't, it doesn't tell us exactly why, but Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go on their second missionary journey. Acts chapter 15 tells us about this. So sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see the, how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly. He said, I'm not taking that mama's boy. There's no way. What we're doing is too important. Paul was so focused and intense. Paul strongly, it was like there was animosity, like there was tension. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work, this, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. And the Apostle Paul goes on a different way and takes somebody else. It's interesting. You know, John Mark made this huge mistake. But Barnabas saw the best in him. And he, and he said, no, 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 I'm going to take him then. Go ahead, Paul, you do your thing, and I'll do my thing. And he takes him. And it's so important because you know that this guy named John Mark who was his mama's boy? You know what he wrote? The Gospel of Mark. Matthew, Mark, right? That's him. This guy who deserted the Apostle Paul. And Barnabas was like, no, 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 Paul. We've got we've to continue to believe and see the best in him. And Paul takes him. We're told in, I think it's Mark chapter 16, uh, you know, about Mark. Well, we're told the story that Jesus is getting, you know, he's being arrested. And the gospel of Mark tells us about a guy who um, is watching all this stuff. And all he has on is like a, a night shirt or something. And he starts to run away. And the Roman soldiers, were the, they grab him and they strip him naked and he runs off. You guys didn't know there was streakers in the Bible. There is. Shriekers. And the shrieker in the Bible was this, most likely it was John Mark. That's why he doesn't mention himself because he didn't want everybody to know that he was a shrieker. That was him. But Barnabas saw the best in him. Barnabas believed and he took him on. I mean, we all need someone like that in our life who will see beyond our past, who will see the best in us, how God wants to use us. You know, it's not just Barnabas then, but even later in life. Listen to how Paul refers to this guy who deserted them. 2 Timothy 4.11 says this. Paul's writing. He says, Luke, the guy who wrote this, the gospel or who wrote Acts, he says, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Philemon, verse 24, again talks about Mark. Paul is writing about this guy. He mentions Mark again, and he calls Mark a co-worker together with Paul. Like, Barnabas, or excuse me, John Mark recovered from all this stuff, and he was a great instrumental part of all of Scripture. But it took a Barnabas in his life to see the best, to encourage him, to come alongside of him. Do you have someone like that in your life? And are you willing to be a Barnabas. Who has God placed in your life that you can do that with? I so hope that Herschel will go home and the rest of you will go home and think, okay, God, let me see with spiritual eyes that I can, and it might not even be, you know, it might just be someone that you meet in a restaurant. You know, we were, we, I hate to tell running stories, but we were running this week and Roger and I, and we were, we were running, it was a long run, so don't, you know, and we were on mile like I don't know, 15, we're going 17 miles, and we're going by this guy's house, and he's got this huge snowblower up in his truck. And I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to try and get this. And he was, he was older, like he was like 55, and I thought, oh, man, this is going to be bad news. <laughs> it's a huge snowblower in his truck. I'm thinking, and I stopped. I said, hey, do you need some help getting that snowblower down? He's like, oh, I was just going to try and muscle it down by myself. Well, he realized I really wanted to stop just because I needed a break. But, you know, <laughs> We stopped, we helped him get the snowboard, and he was so thankful. And I didn't say, hey, bless you in Jesus' name. Nothing like that. I mean, you know. But who can we encourage? Just take a moment. 
When you're in the hospital this week, who is it that needs a word of encouragement from you? We all need a Barnabas in our life, and we need to be a Barnabas to other people. Right? Secondly, and I know I need to move a little quicker here, we all need a Paul in our life. Right? We see all throughout the Bible, all throughout these chapters that we're reading, we see about this guy named Saul who commits his life to Christ. His, his non-Jewish name is Paul. Right? We need someone in our life like this. The Bible says this about Paul. What is it specifically that we need to have a Paul in our life? He says this, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul says, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. He says in Philippians 3, 17, brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Again, another passage, 1 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, I urge you to imitate me. That's why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in, to, in the Lord. Remember we talked about that? He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Paul wasn't shy. Paul wasn't, you know, he's like, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. Guys, and as I follow Jesus, I want you to follow Jesus. You know, again, I hate to keep on picking on Herschel, but, you know, hopefully Herschel's coming on, on Thursday nights to Alpha and we're hanging out and he's like, you know what? I know Pastor Brad's following Jesus. The more I get to know him and I want to follow Jesus just because, because I know that he's following Jesus. And it's not about me. Paul's like, it's not about me. It's about following Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So the question is, who is your role model? Who is the person you see following Jesus in a way that you think that you should. You guys missed out on this, but first service right over here on my left, Katie Carley was sitting over here. And Katie is on staff at Crew, which is a ministry that, at, at University of Toledo. And there was, I think, four or five college students here this morning. Over here. There's a lot of other ones right here. But they're first service. And I had met two of them for the first time. I think Lydia and I forget the other one, sorry. But anyways, and so we were talking and I said, why are you guys here? And they're like, oh, well, Katie invited us. I said, oh, Katie Carley, they're like, yeah. And the one girl's like, yeah, she's discipling me. I was like, oh. See, Katie knows that she is meant to lead others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, go out into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple everyone, he's talking to all of us. Like nobody's, you know, Nady, that's you. Matthew 28, you are supposed to be doing that. Liz, that's you. John, scriptures, Jesus is talking to you. Pat, that's, God's talking to us. Say, we all need a Paul in our life, and we need to be a Paul to other people. You know, one of the things that... Um, that I've, I, you know, I was off Facebook for nine years. You guys know that. I talk about that. I only got back on because of the, of the pandemic, of COVID. But one of the things that's been really cool for me is, you know, I'll post stuff and you guys see that, whatever. And um, if you're on and, and it's great when you guys get on and you respond and so on and so forth. So I, I, that's good, right? I mean, I do that so we can build community and have teaching moments. But what's been really interesting to me is that I have had, you know, um, back when I was a youth pastor, this is, we're talking 24 years ago in Dayton, Ohio, in Kettering, actually. And I had a youth group, and we were there for 10 years. And when, almost whenever I post on Facebook on something, I have all these, I want to say kids, but they're all like 40 years old now. They're like old, but you have all these kids that go on and say things from, you know, you know from stuff that happened 25 years ago. One girl, Amanda Eskins Douglas, I'm talking about you. She went on last week and she said, hey, Pastor Brad, I went on Facebook. Or I went on to watch one of your services lately. And she's like, I couldn't figure out who was the gray-haired guy up there. <laughs> so that was a little bit over the line, Amanda. But it's so encouraging to think, oh, yeah, all these seeds that were planted 25 years ago. And these kids are still connecting. Who's your role model? Who's the person you see following Jesus in a way that you think that you should? We all need a Barnabas. We all need a Tim Paul. And lastly, we all need a Timothy. We all need someone who is following us, who is looking to a Paul for guidance and direction in what it means to live this life for Jesus. And I already kind of talked about this, so I won't spend a lot of time because it's pretty self-explanatory, right? We all need to be pouring into somebody this is what Paul writes about Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He writes, he says, Timothy, my dear son, 
Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1, he says, I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Romans 16, he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends you greetings. Like, there's lots of people in the Bible in particular that Paul was mentoring Somebody specifically like, God, who are you placing in my life that I can look to? And God, who are you placing in my life that I can pour my life into somebody else? What Timothy is there in my life that you can use me to pour my life into that person? It's interesting that uh, you kind of look at Paul's relationship with Timothy and it kind of like was in three different stages. At first, when Paul meets Timothy and we're first introduced in Acts chapter 16, it was kind of like a parent-child type relationship. He looked at Timothy more as a son, right? And we saw this relationship. And then this is kind of your last three fill-ins. And then it kind of moved to where Timothy wasn't just a son, he was just a parent, but Paul was kind of like the pace setter. He was sending Timothy out and he was watching Timothy and encouraging Timothy and making sure that Timothy was following through and helping Timothy along. And at the very end, in like Romans 16 that I just read to you, Paul says, Timothy is my co-laborer. He was his partner in ministry. And that's what our relationship should look like. Who is the Timothy in your life? Last fill in, say this. Who are you pouring your life into so that they can become more like Jesus? It's a challenge for all of us. All of us need to ask that question. God, who have you placed in my life? Okay, let me pray for you guys this morning. Father, thank you so much for my friends that are here this morning and for those that are online, listening in this morning. Thank you for your word which guides us and leads us and teaches us. Jesus, may we allow your words to sink deep into our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you cause your words to take root in our heart and our lives and may we apply the truth of your word to our lives. May we look for those people. May we be a person like that to somebody around us this coming week and in the following weeks as you give us purpose and direction, Father. Show us how we can encourage people. Lord, help us to look for somebody or bring people in our lives who will be an encourager to us like Barnabas was, who will see the best in us and that we can see the best in somebody else, Jesus. We pray for that Paul relationship, someone who is further along in their relationship with you, Jesus, than us, that we can follow hard after them. Help us to look for a Timothy in our life, Jesus, a person that we can pour our hearts and our lives into. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said. Thank you.